So welcome everyone. Uh, first, I want to say thank you for having me here today. Um, well, uh, I'm here to tell you a story, a story about uh, an app with lots of flow, as the title says. Uh, but first, I want uh, to introduce myself, telling you uh, three things, just three, three things, I promise, about me. Uh, the first one is that I'm an Android engineer. I have been breaking apps since 2009. So I have been enjoying all the cool stuff, uh, like async tasks and when fragments were a bit difficult to use. Uh, so yes, I, I have enjoyed a lot of changes in the Android ecosystem. Um, and yeah. um, I'm also Spanish. I live and work from the Canary Island. I, I don't know if you already knew them, but uh, we became very famous lately because of a volcano that we, we had invited here um, like two months ago. Um, and I'm here also to confess that I am a bit a hobby addicted. So I have a lot of, of hobbies and little time to, to spend on them. I try to write to children while I learn to sew, to create my own clothes, uh, to draw, and also the music. And that's the reason maybe the presentation is about um, an app of music, you will see. So music has always played uh, an important part in my life, uh, but it wasn't until two years ago when I decided to start learning music. I went to the music school to enroll my daughter, and I ended up being enrolled myself. So I started learning how to play the, the violin and cello, which is my favorite instrument. And one of the first things uh, you have to learn when you are uh, trying to learn uh, music theory is what is an interval. Okay, so an interval is the gap that exists between two notes. Uh, so for example, here that we can see the C major scale, which is the typical one that we all have learned in the school. Uh, we can say that between, for example, the C and the E notes, there is a third interval. Uh, well, it's a, th a major third, but uh, just for simplification, we are going only to center in the, in the uh, numeral classification. So it looks easy because you just have to count the notes and you know the interval already. But the problem is that you have to recognize it uh, just uh, listening to the sound. And this is kind of difficult unless you have perfect pitch, a perfect ear, which I don't have. Um, so uh, there is a trick you can use, which is to memorize some popular music references. So you take a song that starts with, with, the, uh, with these two notes, and it will make it easier for you to remember that these sounds uh, should sound like uh, that song. For example, in the case of a third, uh, I can think of uh, the famous lullaby of Brahms that sounds like da da. So this is the trick we we use for that. But the problem is I have a little little time to study. I have a very bad memory because all my brain is trying to be updated in, in, in all the Android new libraries and things. So so yeah, I found myself with this problem. How can I learn this new thing? And uh, what does an Android developer when he, she, they have a problem? Well, create an app, obviously. So I decided to create an app to help me learn all those intervals and refer musical references uh, to make it easier to, to memorize them. I decided to make to made an app that was a quiz that will uh, reproduce a sound, and then you have to choose which is the, the interval, the correct interval. As it, it, it was a, a musical app, so I decided to do it with flow. No, yeah, <laughs> there was another reason. I usually, in my job, in my day-by-day -day job, I use Rx Java, uh, and I wanted to, to use flow in, in a production app, in a real app, just to, to check how it will behave. Um, and to learn more about it. And also I, I choose to use MBI just because, not for other reason that, than uh, because I love this uh, architectural pattern. 
uh, I know that uh, maybe it's not uh, the ideal app to, to do it with MBI because you could do it also with an MBVM. But I, I wanted to test both things together because I already use MBI in my work with Aris Java and I wanted to see how, how, could be done, how it could be done. So I, I, I had this intention of compose this symphony that we are going to compose together today. Uh, we are going to, to use uh, or to know these chords that uh, we have here in the, in, the, in the pentagram. And the first one is going to be MBI. So we are going to talk about the origins of MBI and what does it mean for, for an Android app. Uh, so uh, I always uh, life, uh, love to refer to Andres Told uh, to explain MBI because I find that his explain explanation, explanations of how it works are very natural because really uh, MBI is based on, a, on something as natural as a conversation uh, between the human that we, is our user and the computer or the, or the phone in our case. So this communication is, is done uh, through an interface. So the user taps uh, the UI and then something happens in the phone and then the UI uh, changes um, and you see something different. We can see or we can say that uh, the user does an input that changes something in the phone and uh, he or she uh, receive an output as a change in the in the UI. So this looks uh, uh, very similar to something that uh, could be familiar to us as programmer. And this is a function. So what he said, and it was the base for uh, the design of his framework, uh, was that uh, everything is a function, even the um, communication between the user and the machine. And this was uh, the, the framework in which uh, Hans Dorfman was inspired to use MB, uh, to create MBI in the for the Android framework. So uh, what we do, or, or the base of this, is uh, we have action to manipulate the model that uh, are called intent. I really don't like the intent because in Android it's very confusing. But just think about it as in user intentions, user. Uh, interactions. Uh, these actions manipulate the model. Uh, they change it somehow. For example, if you add a row to a list, the model will change and there will be another row, whatever. And then you will have a new model to display that will modify the view. So everything is modeled uh, in, in a set of, of functions. So in our case, the interaction is the intent. The model is, well, the model that is changed inside the computer, the phone, and then we, we have a view. And this is the way that uh, we started modeling the MBI in Android. Uh, we generate intents uh, after the user does something, a tab, uh, a gesture, whatever. They are interpreted uh, by the interpreter and they are mapped to an action. An action is like the domain part of the intent. We will see later what does it mean. Uh, then we have the processor that will do all the magic, it, uh, all the side effects. Uh, it will remove rows or records from the database. It will uh, do the request to the service, whatever we have to do. Uh, and then it will uh, return a result that which we uh, will be processed in the reducer uh, using the last view state to generate a new view state. I don't like to use intent, as I say, so I prefer uh, using UI event because for you know our Android minds is easier to, to refer to it. So let's start with every part of this uh, flow. flow. Um, let's start with the UI event interpreter and action part. So for example, for my case, uh, where I have an app that uh, shows a, a quiz, I have uh, this kind of events. Uh, I have an event to start the quiz. When the user selects start, 
then I will have a select answer. When the user select an answer from the uh, question, I will have the C results. When the user select the option to see the results, I will have a navigate to example um, action when the user want to see the, uh, to listen to the song or the reference related. And then I will have a, a finish uh, event. And in the action part, which uh, is made to you know, model the domain uh, action, I will have get the first first question, select answers, results, navigate to sample, and finish, which are pretty similar. So in this case, uh, we will have a map that is mapping almost the same. Uh, so I opt for uh, removing the interpreter and the action. Uh, because I feel that it will be less uh, complicated for, for the case. Uh, there will be other cases where um, you cannot do that. Oh. Well, <laughs> this is what I did. For example, if you are mapping several UI events to the same actions, if you have an event that uh, is first, uh, you have a list, imagine you have a list, and you have an event to load the list the first time, and then you have another uh, event when the user uh, reaches the bottom of the list and you want to load another page. So you can use an action for both or those events. In that, in that case, uh, is, is, uh, if you want to, to map uh, several action, uh, the same action, uh, you will need the interpreter. But in my case, I, I thought it, it wasn't necessary uh, just to be pragmatic and, and to and to not uh, having that step because I didn't need it. So the next step uh, is to send the action to the processor. So uh, the thing that it needs to do uh, gets done. So for example, in my case, uh, I sent uh, the star keys, uh, quiz action and the, the action that the processor will do will be, for example, get first question. That will return a result uh, with this uh, information. There's another thing that I used to do in, in this processor. Um, I have put the domain here uh, in brackets uh, because um, sometimes what I usually do uh, is to connect the processor with the use cases. Um, in my case, in this case, it wasn't necessary because they were like very anemic. So uh, as always, you have to choose whatever fits your needs or whatever uh, fits the needs of your team, um, be pragmatic. So you have both options. You can connect your processor to the domain directly uh, or to the use cases and call every use case that you're going to use. Uh, or, or also, you, you could connect it to your repositories, whatever you, you need. I have seen also implementations where you implement the logic in the processor, but I, you know, of every axiom. But I don't like that because uh, it will make the processor to have more than what's one responsibility and it will get complicated uh, as long as it start growing. But yes, whatever uh, you need. And then uh, after we get this result, we are going to process the result with the last view state to generate a new view state using the reducer. So for example, I have just two example results here that will be next question update. That will be the result that we'll, we will get before uh, answering any of the questions, and it will contain, uh, and in the case that we uh, get the question uh, successfully, uh, will contain the, ne the next question, but if not, it, it will contain a failure with the error, or it will be uh, in the first, if, if it is the, the, the first time we are con uh, sending the action of uh, answering, Meanwhile, is uh, obtaining the, the next question, uh, it will return this uh, loading uh, object. So here in the reducer, uh, we will obtain a new view state. There are two options to model this view state, as I have seen so far. 
uh, one of them is to model it as a data class. So you include all the uh, stuff that you have in your view here. Uh, for example, if you have a spinner, you can include uh, an is loading field, uh, the question you are going to show in UI results, in my case, uh, when, when you are going to sh uh, show the results, whatever, if there has been an error, et cetera. And there's another option that is to use SIL classes to model the view state. So uh, depending on the state, uh, if, if it is loading, if it, if it is error, if it is show result, or if it is show question, you will have a, a different uh, data class. How could I take this decision to use or a data class or a view state? Uh, sorry, or a SIL class for my view state? Uh, well, for me, what it was, uh, have worked so far is that if uh, I can have more than one view state at the same, same time, for example, I want to show the role while show, showing the question, I will use a data class. But if my view state must be mutual exclusive, and um, then I will use a SIL class because, because it, will me, uh, it will make processing really easier. So it depends on, on your needs, as always. <laughs> um, and then we have the reducer, um, which is as easier as this. So we'll receive uh, the update, and then we will set the state, uh, copying the, the last view state we had and uh, modifying whatever we need. For example, if we receive a next question update Sussex, we will copy the last view state and uh, I will change, for example, the question. Also, well, you have to take care just in case that if it is loading, you have set it to false and if there was an error, you, can set, set, you have to set it to null. So you have to be careful somehow with, with the other fields. If, if, you're, if you see that your reducer grows a lot, then I recommend you to have several reducers. I have seen reducers that are monstrous. Um, and if we want to keep simplicity, uh, well, I think that we have to divide the, uh, the responsibilities and have several reducers and map the, the results to to the one that uh, can handle the changes. And now that we have MBI, more or less, we are going to continue with uh, defining with uh, what is unidirectional data flow. And it's really easy because this is unidirectional data flow. It's a flow that starts in the point, point A, which is the UI event generated by the user, and goes using the same uh, path until the point B, which is uh, where the screen will render the, the new view state. I always like to think about it as a pipe where you uh, introduce your events and then you get your view state and anything can go out of this or the events cannot uh, be processed, uh, a second event cannot be processed first than a first event. But how can we make this work? Because we have uh, an interpreter, then we have a processor, and then we have uh, this reducer that will generate my, uh, my view state. But we want them to follow this unidirectional data flow, to be in this pipe, to follow this order. And this is when flow comes to, to a sim. Uh, flow is a called stream. That means that it's a pipe where we can emit elements. And the, those elements will start uh, be emitted uh, once we have someone connected in, in the point B. Uh, as it, it is part of the coroutines API, also has a structured concurrency, uh, has method for fission data transformation. As, and it's really easy to test because you just have to emit something collect it and see if yeah, the data is what you are expecting. So you have, as part of the flow, you always will have an emitter and a collector. And this looks pretty similar to what we want, because we want an emitter that will be the user. And then we have a collector that will be the screen. So for that, 
uh, we can use the flow builders to create the meter, the flow operators to do the transformation we need, and the flow collectors to uh, process that, inform that information and render every new change of the view. So as flow builders, uh, the most famous or, or most useful ones are flow that create a flow with the given suspendable block, flow off that defines a flow that will emit a fixed set of values, and as flow that is an extension, wonderful extension function for collections and sequences. Then we have the operators. I think they don't need more explanation because we have already used them even in collections or, or previously in RS Java. Uh, but map, for example, uh, modifies every one of the emissions. A uh, filter allows us to uh, return a, another flow containing all, only the values that uh, um, that match the predicate that we define there, take that returns a flow that contains the number of elements that we have indicated and this thing until change that uh, only will uh, emit those elements that uh, have changed. Then we also have flattening flow operators that we allow us to uh, having a flow inside to flatten that flow and convert it uh, and emit them as part of our main flow. And also we have flow collectors like collect that will allow us to collect all the missions, reduce that will keep an accumulator and will apply the uh, current value to the accumulator. Fold that is pretty similar to reduce but allows us to define the first value for the accumulator. And first, that we will uh, we will use to collect just the first element. Okay, so here we have again our graph, and we are going to translate it in code to something like that. So we will have something that will emit the UI events, hopefully a flow. Then we will map it. Uh, we'll map it to an action. Then we will map it again. Uh, it will uh, go to the processor and it will be, will be processed and generate a result. In my case, for example, uh, I skip this part, the part the, of map to action. And then we will have to collect it and to uh, share this or flu uh, publish this new view state after it has been reduced to the UI. But flows are called, so we cannot uh, do this without another element, which is the state flow. So a state flow is a read-only state uh, with a value that emits update to the value to its collector. Uh, it's a hot flow because it's active um, independently of the presence of collectors. Um, for example, we can use it uh, to, to publish our, our view state. So every time we change the view state, now in the view, we will be collecting uh, those new view state. Uh, we'll be rendering, changing whatever we want. If we, if we are using uh, data binding, whatever, uh, or, or compose, uh, we can we can use this uh, state flow also directly. Um, but we still need something to uh, publish the, the events that, that are, are taking place in the UI. For example, the user tabs, the user gesture, whatever. And we cannot use a state flow. Why we cannot use the state flow? Because uh, it is conflated. That means that it already has um, implemented uh, the distinct until change uh, operator. So for the user interaction, we don't want to skip two sequential tabs because we need all to we need to receive all the events. So for that, we are going to take share flow. That uh, is the uh, is a generalization of a state flow, um, and then from the UI. Uh, we will be emitting in our 
action flow uh, every event. For example, when uh, the user taps uh, the start quiz button, we will emit the UI event start quiz. And then we have our MBI fully composed. It will look something like this. And we can think that we have finished, but nope, there is always an, no, a but in this case. In this case is, is the infamous single event. And what is a single event? Well, it's an event that we want to happen only once in the view and then stop. Uh, it should stop happening. For example, a toast. If we put in our view state that we have to show a toast and we show it in the screen and then something happened, a uh, configuration change, whatever. And then it, our state flow will emit again the, the last view state with this wonderful toast again. And we will see again, and we, and we, we don't want that. So for that, I have seen several ways to solve it. I'm not happy with any of them, but whatever ones you prefer, you can use. Uh, for example, I have seen uh, uh, the use of a different flow, flow for that. Uh, in that case, to use a channel because channel will not store the, the missions. So if you emit uh, this kind of event using the channel, it, they will be only sent once. Then the other option is to use the same flow I mean, emitting an, an UI event as soon as the single event has been shown. And that UI event has to do all the flow, which is really verbose for something that should be very you know, simple um, and not complicated. And then another approach that I, ha I, have, I have seen is to send double view state events. So when I send a view state saying, show the toast to show at the same time, and, be, and after that one, one uh, removing it from the state. Every one of them has its cons and uh, its pros, but yeah, the, I haven't found any solution that I say, this is the one. And yes, I'm still here trying to learn music. I still, this app, uh, in fact, is a, is a work in progress. Uh, but I promise that the next time I will remember all the musical references. And here you have a lot of some non, not musical references in this case. Uh, these are the, the resources I have used uh, for this presentation. And thank you for your time tonight. And if you have any question, feel free to, to ask me. I'm going to remove this from the full screen so I can see you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you indeed for the, for the talk. It was marvelous. And uh, I especially like the uh, graphics on the slides. I think those are very well done. Uh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> and I, I actually got to learn something about music. That's, that was also fun. <laughs> OK, so getting <laughs> to the questions. So from the first one comes from Clemens uh, Sleptik. For what type of apps would you recommend MBI over other patterns? Uh, in my experience, I think the, the best apps uh, to use MBI are those ones that require a lot of interactions asynchronously in the UI. Uh, for example, a map. I think the, the, uh, an app with a map that where you can do zoom, you can uh, change the camera, you can uh, go somewhere, you can get uh, location updates. So if you have a lot of interaction from the user, I think it's worth it to implement MBI. Because the, I think the, the worst problem of MBI, if that is really verbose, and you have to create a huge structure to do things that seems really simple to do in MVVM. But if you have seen something like that with a lot of events, and you want to process them in order I think that uh, is the best, uh, in my experience, the best uh, architectural pattern to use. I see. OK, so let me jump to another question, because I think it's related. So it's from uh, Dhruv Meta. I hope I pronounced it right. Uh, 
MVVM or MVI, which do you prefer and why? I think you already <laughs> kind of delved into it a little bit, so. I, I'm not going to be object, objective in, in this one <laughs> because I really like to use MVI. I'm fully aware of the cons of MBI. I, as I have said, um, it's, uh, it's hard. It's not hard, but it's very verbose and you have to do a lot of uh, you know, stuff to create a structure. The good thing is that once you have that in place, it's easier to uh, add more functionality because you just know where to add it. And, also, it's really easy to test because you can test every one of the steps. Um, also, MVVM uh, is good. Uh, I I use it in some of my projects. Uh, it's easier to use, um, has less verbosity. So I think that uh, I, I'm, going, I'm not going to, to answer the, the question. I'm going to say it, it depends on the project. Uh, and the needs that that I have at the moment, so it depends. Yeah, sure. As any any good question, basically almost any good question, the answer is it depends. And what I really wanted to just add: don't don't use an architecture because you heard it's cool. Mm. Try to try to think about your actual needs and what fits that. If I can say that. Yeah. Thanks for the answer as well. Uh, really? So the next. So the next question comes from Vivian de Souza. Uh, can you recommend some good resources to learn from? I guess you showed a bunch of resources at the end already. Yes, yes. I don't have, at the moment, I don't have any at my mind, but maybe if I come across, I have to recheck. Uh, I can publish them on Twitter if I find anything. But I, I think the internet is full of resources. Uh, YouTube, there are really good talks there uh, from conferences. Uh, in Medium, you can also find a lot of uh, you know, articles from great developers. So um, I don't have a you know, um, yeah. hard preference or. <laughs> mm -hmm. OK, cool. Uh, so next one comes from Cristiano Munaro. Uh, how do you handle general errors? Uh, state at our state like no internet connection okay so in this case i didn't implement that but for example in in the app that we, that i am working currently at work uh, we have in in our um in our uh, processors we have another flow uh, no it's not a flow another entry uh, which is uh, external um, events. Not on, we don't uh, we don't only have user events. We have external events, and the internet connection is is one of them. So if everything changes in the internet connection in our processor, we will get a result, an update saying that there are not internet connection. And then in the reducer, uh, we handle that case. But. Uh, in this app, for example, I I am not uh, doing that. Mm -hmm. And I will actually put up another question. I think it's closely related. Uh, I guess your answer will be similar. So this is coming from uh, um, Nikolai Demko. Yeah, yes, that's, that's exactly about, uh, I was wondering about uh, location changes, but I guess the answer is really sim similar, right? Yes, yes, yes. That's another thing that we have connected to our processor is the geolocation. So we receive also all the geolocation updates. And if they change in you know, X meters, uh, the processor will generate a result that will be, be processed by the by the reducer. In the case that the view is a map, for example, it will be shown with the with the change. So yeah, we have, it's not an ideal unidirectional data flow because we have to uh, flows where we can get uh, events, but it's the solution that is working for us right now. Okay. So next one, uh, coming from uh, Jose Cardama, Hopefully it's not Jose, but if it's if it is, sorry <laughs> for the first mistake. Jose, so, Jose, I think. <laughs> Jose, then, okay, hopefully. Uh, 
how does MBI integrate with Jetpack Compose? Well, I haven't integrated yet, but as a Jetpack Compose requires a, an state, a single state that uh, will be, if I remember well, because I'm not using it uh, professionally. Um, so you will get that view state, and it will be the view state that you will use to uh, populate your uh, every one of your, I don't remember the name, your elements. Uh, in the compose, uh, you know, uh, oh, come on, I have forget everything. Now I, I, am, I, I am an iOS developer. Thank you, Composables. <laughs> Thank you. So for, for uh, when you work with Compose, you need, you need an you idea, ideally a unique uh, uh, source of truth that has to be uh, the state, and then you uh, could uh, propagate that no, you have to set this in the high level composable that will share with its children. And I think that it will integrate uh, really nicely. I haven't done it yet, so I'm just uh, talking about this as a theory, but I think that it will integrate really nicely. And then you have okay. support for state flow, and also you have support for IS Java, if I'm, I am not mistaken. Yeah, okay. Uh, next one, Christopher Oyarsun. Uh, how would you use MBI combined with Clean Architecture? Okay, so so here, really MBI is um, operating really in the presentation lawyer, uh, lawyer, <laughs> liar. Uh, so, for example, in, in our case, uh, what we do is uh, we have MBI in the presentation. Then we have uh, our domain layer that is connected with, uh, you know, the data layer. So I think you can combine both without any problem. The same way you combine MBVM with uh, Clean Architect. Okay. The next one's coming from Tal uh, Krishbam. Maybe uh, when using state flow, do you think it's beneficial to define the data type of the flow as state flow, or is it better to simply use the flow? Mm, well, it depends. I I don't have a a hard preference to for this. So um, really, yeah. I when I have been using state flow. Uh, I have just yes, defined it as a state flow, and then all the um, you know methods uh, I call inside the flow, or for example in the map or whatever, I just uh, use suspend function because I don't have really in this case anything that is going to uh, emit more than once. So in my case, I think it, it wasn't needed, but it depends. Yeah. Okay. Um, next one, uh, Abdullah Hanif uh, asks about uh, I'm moving away from live data. State flow is coming in. I'm not sure, but but does come is coming in should mean here. Well, maybe it's because you know state flow is like the latest thing between the live data and the state flow. Um, I have seen a lot of people moving from live data because there are some um, cases where they, I don't know if I should say work as expected, but maybe I should say work as expected because for example, if you use post value and the main thread is blocked, it will skip the emissions, things like that. And state flow is, a bit more clear, uh, the internals are more clear. So I think people are getting a preference uh, to move to from light data to a state flow, but we don't know. I see. Okay, I will jump a bunch of them now and uh, because we are coming up at the end, but I will also let you pick some afterwards. But uh, there's an interesting one here about uh, from Andres. Uh, Oscar, um, 
actually two questions. It's okay if you only question, only answer one as well. How do you solve the flow not emitting the same event twice since the hash is the same? Could it be, uh, are you talking about a state flow? Because in the case of the state flow, it will not em emit the same event twice when the hash is the same because it's conflated. So it has internally uh, implemented the uh, this thing until change. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is interesting as well. I wanted to ask it as well if if would have if there would have been time. But uh, so <laughs> sometimes if you execute two, two UI events sequentially, the second one is not executed. Uh, basically, uh, touching a little bit on that. What do you say about concurrency and the uh, synchronicity of MBI in general? How would you handle that? Um, do you mean that you have two UI events? Uh, they are emitted very uh, close in time, and the second one is not executed. Yeah, I, I, if I understood correctly, that you need to kind of synchronize it in the in the event handling. Otherwise, you would come up with a misconfigured state, unless you will have distinct states, of course. But that, that's not the problem then. But so, how, how would you suggest dealing with that? Well, I have seen, but uh, I have seen this situation, but not with a state flow. I have seen it with the live data, for example. I have seen people that saw this uh, adding some kind of a delay, uh, but I don't know. I don't know how to answer this one. It's okay. We can move forward, and hmm. I will let you pick actually what you would like to answer. Uh, I can. I think you can pick two still. Okay. Let me see. Uh, I, I have to go to the bottom, is it? Um, this is a... Uh, how can I choose one? I If you say I can show it as well, but there should be a show on stage button. Okay. Um, well, maybe this one about the intents. Why do you don't like to use intents in Android? I should put it on stage. Okay, so I, yes. So the thing is, uh, I don't like to use the word intent for the interaction between the user and the and the and the screen. Uh, of course, I use intents to travel between activities, but in this case, uh, well, it, it has been used. So it has, uh, when MBI confronts, is, it is model view intent. But in, in the Android world, it, it, it doesn't sound really good because we tend to think about the other intents, the activity intents. So that's the reason I don't, I don't like it. But Everyone yeah, it didn't, mean, it didn't mean that you don't like uh, the Android intent. You just said that uh, yes, like yes. refer to the intent in MBI in a different way, but just not to confuse the two. By the way, I got uh, news about we can go over time, so we can go through all the questions. So I will resume putting them one by one on screen. Oh, great. So, Abdul, from Abdullah Hanif, uh, there's a question about which library do you suggest to test flows? Uh, and he heard about uh, two mine. I haven't used any yet. I just uh, tested uh, just um, collecting the mission and checking that uh, I, am, I am getting the value that is expected. But I will have a look. Sounds interesting. OK. So from Alan Gerard, uh, sorry if I mispronounced, uh, what do you think about mixing Rx Java and Coroutine Slow in the same project? Or should we, or we should stick with the only one? I don't know. It depends. Maybe if you are moving from one to another, but if if you want, uh, I, I will go yes for one of them because things will get very complicated just to debug one thing. Um, you can get uh, you know unexpected behavior. So I I will stick which uh, with one of them. Uh, and oh, uh, and with with mix them just in the gate that, that that I'm trying to migrate from one to another, and I want it to to be you know 
a step migration, but I wouldn't mix them up. I see. Also, well, if you have different modules and you can have different behavior in the modules, well, uh, it's not, it will be not a problem, but if you're going to combine them, you know, in a layer, you are going to use coroutines and then in another layer, uh, layer Rx Java, maybe it could be difficult to debug if you have any kind of problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so from Vivek Sharma, uh, why can't we just use shared flow for just showing Toast or Snack Bar? Snack bar? Uh, can we just use them for a single time event? We can use it, but uh, we will have the same that we will have. Um, the problem here is that uh, if you uh, come back and reconnect to the share flow, uh, if the last event was at all, uh, show the toast or show the snack bar, you are going to get the same emission again. So you can use share flow for that, but you have to be careful and, and change the your state when when you show them. Okay. So again, from Jose Cardama, do you recommend using Flow with WebSockets or should we use something else? Which is That's a good that? question that I don't know how to answer. <laughs> I have used WebSocket, but not with Flow yet. I have used them with uh, Alex Java. I don't know. I cannot answer. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Cannot know everything. Well, they showed a lot of, or well, they shared a lot of knowledge. So one, one, one more, one last from Tyler. What are from, what are some best practices for handling side effects for an MBI? Well, I will say the same that we say when we talk with, about MBI, and uh, you have to try to send all your side effects to the processor because that, that is the place where they have to happen and is, uh, is one of the benefits of MBI because you know uh, and have a control place where side effects are happening. If we don't consider changing the screen <laughs> as, a, as a side effect, which we could do, but uh, I mean, side effects like changing database, changing something in the service, whatever, changing, you know, the state of the app or whatever like that. Yeah, so thank you for the great questions. That was all. And I uh, hope you enjoyed the talk. I certainly did. And uh, it was a good uh, discussion or a uh, great deal of answers. Thank you for that, Hema, as well. Uh, thank you. Thank you for having me and thank you for for having all those questions, very interested discussions here. Um, and I hope you enjoy it. Yeah, so I will uh, I will say goodbye now. Uh, the next uh, presentation will start uh, about, uh, about 10 minutes. Uh, and I, that will, this is the last time you heard from me as well. So have a nice rest of the day, evening, morning, afternoon, whatever is it in your time zone and make sure to stick around. And if you can, share love, share Android Worldwide and Android Budapest. Uh, we are on Twitter, uh, at Android WW underscore and at Android Budapest. And if you want, you can just uh, say again where people can reach you, Hema. Yes, uh, they can find me in Twitter in at uh, G-M-A. <laughs> well... <laughs> Uh, I don't know if it's, if they're in the well. You can you write in the see. chat as well, but also... yes, you can find me here. Yeah, <laughs> it's, I I have shut already my brain. Sorry, but anyway, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> have a nice day. Have a nice evening, everyone. Sure. Bye. Bye.